So let's uh, just uh, start, I, I believe. Uh, so yeah, thank you all for uh, being here. Um, so this uh, presentation about the rise and fall and rise of virtual reality. Uh, I think it's really cool that Code Motion asked me to speak uh, here. I asked them, should I go a little bit more into the code? But they really wanted me to show a little bit more of the work that I'm doing. Uh, so I put a little kind of uh, topics into here. We've got 40 minutes, so that's, you know, uh, we've got a lot that we can discuss in 40 minutes. I just wanted to do a quick introduction uh, of uh, myself and my company. Uh, then I would like to talk about the rise and fall and rise of virtual reality. And uh, I would then like to get into kind of these business cases, the stuff I've been uh, doing in the past uh, two years uh, for VR, and uh, maybe also inspire you to maybe think about what you can do with virtual reality. So who of you is already into virtual reality? Just uh, you are. Uh, ah, yeah, one in the back. <laughs> cool. Uh, so the others, well, I, I bet like you will be within a short period of time, you will touch virtual reality because it will really change, I think, a lot in this world. Uh, so let me just first begin with the introduction. So my name is uh, Adrian Reikens. Uh, I'm uh, both developer and founder of VR Heroes. Uh, VR Heroes is a company that really looks at new technology. Uh, we see all these new technologies popping up, you know, Internet of Things, augmented, virtual reality, responsive websites, apps, blah, 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 and all these companies drown in, you know, what can I do with that? So kind of the stuff that I do is I, I work with a lot of different companies and really think for them, what you can do with virtual reality. And I've got a very big network of programmers, uh, designers, uh, modelers, filmmakers with who I work. Uh, it's always like standing on the shoulders of giants. And, uh, and I'm doing these kind of, uh, uh, I'm doing these uh, projects for companies like uh, KLM, Heineken, uh, Rijkswaterstaat. But I'm going to talk a bit, a, a bit about the business case I'm doing later on. Uh, but my focus with the company is virtual reality, and that's really something I'm really, uh, really excited about. Um, and therefore, I would like to start this talk about why is virtual reality so interesting. But let's start about what's virtual reality. So I guess you already have got all an idea what virtual reality is. I just wanted to challenge that idea a bit, because uh, I don't know who, how many of you are Dutch here, and how many of you know the Panorama Mestag? It's this, uh, it's this uh, place in The Hague. It's, uh, you can uh, go there and you can actually step into a painting. They've got a 360 degree painting there. And it's really as if you're in this magical uh, kind of uh, beach-like scene. And the cool thing is, so this already existed in 1881. And you had these places all over Europe. And they would kind of, uh, they would... Uh, uh, move these paintings from one place to another. So you could be in the Netherlands, in The Hague, you could stand like in Berlin, you could see Berlin around you. So kind of immersing people into this place or in this place where they're actually not, but you're trying to immerse them as if they are somewhere else that already existed, that concept. But yeah, w what's VR, what we're talking about? We have to you know, set a little bit of a standard. So it's also a kind of a, a paradox, I think, virtual reality. Uh, is virtual, is that real? It's kind of, I bet you all know the, uh, the Matrix, where this Neo stands at his chair. He says, but this chair isn't real. And then Morpheus goes like, uh, but uh, you know, uh, if, if you're talking about what you touch and smell and see and hear, like real is uh, electrical signal to signals interpreted by your brain. So kind of you can have a whole session on what is real, what is virtual reality. I actually did a session on that. We had a two hour uh, session on, on this, but let's just for now say to make it easy that um, you, can, uh, you can immerse a lot of senses with virtual reality, but to make it easy, what we're really focused on nowadays with virtual reality is immersing the sight and the hearing. And you can also do touch and smell and all these other things, but the focus is really on what you hear and what you see. And uh, what you want to create with that is the state of presence, being somewhere else. So yeah, we've got a lot of uh, virtual reality glasses. So we were talking, I said I want to talk about the rise of virtual reality. I think that if you really talk about what really set kind of the, there was a, like a, a starting signal that all these companies suddenly started looking into virtual reality, all these media uh, channels started looking into virtual reality. There was actually Facebook acquiring uh, Oculus, 
uh, they, in, in those days, they didn't have this really nice glasses. They were look, looking a little bit more bulky. But that really set the kind of, uh, that, that started the whole hype around Frecciati. I will talk about the hype word a little bit later. But uh, Oculus also started to work with Samsung. Samsung also got into Frecciati. I love the Gear VR. And uh, Google made this great, great kind of imitation of VR by just creating this cardboard version. Just for a couple of euros, you can experience virtuality. And HTC, uh, I think they've got one of the best HMDs at the moment if it comes to really being present somewhere. You can walk with the HTC on, and you can actually try it uh, here. Uh, there's a guy uh, who's got, uh, got a HTC uh, uh, setup here below. So if, in, if you haven't tried it yet, the HTC, really ch go check it out after this uh, presentation. And then uh, finally, I would also like to mention uh, uh, the Sony with the PlayStation VR, which might also uh, uh, have an impact on the virtual reality world. But I think what you're now seeing, all these uh, VR glasses, are this, these are the most important ones, in my opinion. Um, and what we're going to see this year is who is going to kind of gain, uh, going, to, uh, going to get some market share. So uh, if it comes to the rise of VR, well, we've got these great graphs. And interesting to see, this is a, a graph where you see both augmented and virtual reality. Interesting to see is that actually augmented is really going to kind of uh, well, it's going to not obliterate, uh, obliterate uh, virtuality, but augment is going to be more important. But at the moment, I believe virtuality is the most important one because you can do everything they want to do with augmented in virtual reality, only then you're in a confined space and not having the world around you. But uh, augmented still has a long way to go before it really becomes impressive and interesting to use for uh, for, uh, um, for, for valuable experiences. So uh, I just heard at a, pre at a previous presentation that the Gartner hype cycle is a great uh, way to show what the progress is of a technology, so I really like to hear that because I myself also really like this graph. And here you can actually see where virtual reality is. So actually they said the peak of inflated expectations, so that's at some point they really hype a technology. Well, Virtuality already surpassed that, and they're now going to the slope, slowly going to the slope of enlightenment. However, it really uh, still needs five to ten years be before it gets to kind of a, a place where it's really an enlightened uh, uh, technology. Um, but um, I want to challenge this a bit because I was just talking about the word hype. I think there's a little hype at the moment about virtuality because people are really super psyched what you can do. But at the same time, I see um, uh, not yet a lot of companies are really looking at the added value of virtuality. So what you're going to see is uh, you see a lot of roller coaster kind of demos at conferences and stuff. And you know that that's cool. And I, I love to do those things. But in a year from now, all those companies who didn't think about virtuality in more a serious way, they're just going to think like this was a one, once in a lifetime fun thing to do and uh, uh, we're not going to use this technology. But that's why it's so important that we have to think about business cases. What's the added value of virtual reality? And uh, I think we're at the moment really like uh, at the, in the 90s and 90s of the internet, we're really starting to see the potential of what virtuality ha has, but it's not yet that clear for everyone. And I just want to give a little is illustration. This is an old website of uh, Amazon. You know, in those days, who could ever thought that they would kind of, you know, obliterate uh, the l largest uh, bookstore, uh, Barnes & Nobles, uh, I mean, of course, they're doing more than books now, Amazon, but it's kind of, you know, uh, things can go really rapidly. But we started off with, yeah, with a, uh, with a, uh, a very simple website. Um, just uh, to um, uh, recap on this uh, rise, fall, and rise of virtuality. So, uh, as I said, like, virtuality has already been there for a long time, the concept of virtuality. In the 90s, actually, you have also seen it. I didn't talk about that. But now you're seeing really a, a new rise of virtuality. I think there will be a small dip in the next year, but from there, uh, companies, and I hope also my company, are really working on the added value of virtuality and uh, will actually make, make these cool business cases. 
Um, so I wanted to cut the story in three kind of uh, in three uh, parts. Um, so I just want to ask: Do you already have any questions about what I've just been showing? Like some uh, things you are now having like uh, doubts about, or uh... no? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, so on, on purpose, I, I skipped augmented because it's also very important when you're working on a technology not to get lost in all these things happening. But uh, with VR, uh, we are always, always looking with one eye to, in, to augment reality. So uh, it, because it's, it, it's such, it, it can make such a big impact, this, for, uh, this augmented reality. And we love the videos of Magic Leap. It's a company, if you haven't looked, uh, don't know what Magic Leap is, really look it up on YouTube. They've got these great demonstrations of how the future of computing will be. I mean, you will have computer screens around you, so I love augmented reality. But uh, as I said, I think that technology is still in a very, uh, yeah, in a very beg in the beginning phase. You've got now the HoloLens of Microsoft, but that's still, uh, you still have got the feeling that there's a screen in front of you instead of really being immersed in the computer world. But uh, it, we will keep looking at it, and so at some point we might think like, okay, now augmented has got more added value than uh, virtual. So, but uh, okay, then I'll, then I'll just uh, go to uh, the marketing uh, side of things. Uh, so I'm doing two kind of uh, examples of what you can do with virtuality. I'm going to talk about kind of the marketing stuff you can do, and I'm going to talk about the training stuff. I personally love the training stuff, but I also like to show something on marketing. Uh, but in the end, uh, as I said, we're still exploring the business cases of virtual reality. So um, you can, in, in, in whatever profession somebody is, this person can think about what can virtual reality really add to us, uh, to, to what can it ha have as an added value. And, uh, and that's, so the examples that I will give are just a couple of examples, but there's so much there. And in these years, we'll just have to see what works and what does not work. So yeah, for marketing purposes, it is a, a giveaway, but uh, I'm into virtuality, so I'm not sure if it's a giveaway for you guys. Uh, I always call virtuality the ultimate uh, transportation tool. It's, it's the way to be somewhere else. Once you put that, those glasses on, it's as if you're there. And therefore, it's, if you think about it, it's a great way to put people at a place where they're not yet there. So uh, one of the things we've been doing was for the uh, port of uh, Amsterdam. So here in Amsterdam, we made this uh, 360 video production for them. And we went to nine different locations and tried to really capture these locations in a very interesting, unique way. So the audience would be kind of have this awe, amazed feeling. You actually see this is a, I always call them two by ones. This is a, for, for virtuality a, a, a video. So you won't see the distortion as you see it now when you've got the glasses on. Uh, so you see here really sites that normally as the general public you would not see. Uh, the port of Amsterdam is actually using this for both their sales team to go to these conferences and show like shikes uh, that their oil tankers can also go to the port of Amsterdam, but also for public relations. Uh, so for uh, people who want to know more about the port of Amsterdam, they can view this and uh, well, you can, uh, the video stops now, but you can watch it on my uh, website. Uh, uh, so this is a way to really, you know, transport people to different places. Um, so also what's interesting is how can you use that for an infrastructure that has not yet been built? Uh, so this is where we're actually, uh, si since uh, a couple of months, we're working with Rijkswaterstaat, which is a very big uh, infrastructure uh, governmental agency in the Netherlands. And it's really cool because uh, Rijkswaterstaat is working on these really, really big projects, but they're usually so big that it's really difficult to imagine how things will be. And of course, you can great create these great uh, images, as you see here, but what you can also do is really create models where people can walk around. And usually, when people are immersed in virtuality, they suddenly really get what they're doing. And even the people who are working on these projects can use that to uh, to understand actually what, you know, uh, somebody's working maybe on one project on the bridge, 
but somebody else is uh, working on the bridge on the other side or on the uh, nature uh, part. So, so everybody can get a much better feeling about what they're doing. And this is already actually, uh, the infrastructure stuff is already done a lot, and we're really glad that we're also working on that. Uh, our first project, however, is now that we're uh, creating a 360-degree video, uh, of, a, uh, of an existing structure, and we're going to show that at a European uh, Union uh, gathering, because they can, cannot move the people to the project, so they, will, they just move the project to the people by showing it in the glasses. Uh, so what I also love is for marketing purposes, if it comes to product marketing, so using virtuality for product marketing, um, you can imagine that how to create a feeling around your product or around your service is something that you really can do when you have got people inside the glasses. You've got their total attention when people have got their glasses on because they haven't got only glasses on, but they also got their uh, uh, headphone on. As I said, it's mainly ears and sight, so you can really tell them this message, really convey a message what you want to do. And I love one of these business cases that there is that actually Volvo did. This is something I did not do, but I love to watch this video because it really shows uh, what you can do when it comes to product experiences. The all-new XC90 is the new Volvo. It's the first car that represents a rebirth of the Volvo company. It has an intuitive design, very simple, very luxurious. We wanted for many people to experience the joy we feel around this car. The challenge was that the XC90 was not going to arrive in showrooms for many months yet. What we wanted to do is try to figure out a way that we could put people inside the car without the car physically being there. The solution that we came up with was to use Google Cardboard, which is a brand new, low-cost virtual reality platform. This is the first time any brand has done anything like this. We're shooting an immersive experience for Volvo. We're going to be taking the Volvo XC90 on a journey through the landscape here in Vancouver. We are obviously very colored by our Swedish heritage, open space, quietness, fresh air, those are the things that inspire us at Volvo. Those are the things we translate into the design of our cars. We've got eight cameras in an array here. There's about um, close to $800,000 worth of gear sitting behind me right now, which is pretty cool and a little scary. <laughs> We're going to be shooting on a 60-mile stretch of road to try and collect all of this environment data. We're going to be blending this with a CG build of an interior of a car the two will kind of seamlessly kind of integrate. We've are indeed in CG and digital the camera positions that we need in order to capture the entire panorama around the driver and also the moon roof above him. The best thing about Google Cardboard is that it allows us to reach so many people. You fold this thing together, you slide your smartphone into it. As a user, it makes you feel like you're really inside the car. It is really a test drive for everyone. It's simple, it's playful, and also grown-up should be allowed to play a little. When you're in the experience, you'll be sat at the driver's seat of the Volvo. You can look around, you take in all the interior. What we've done here with Google Cardboard and Volvo is really the best of innovation because it's not just using technology for its own sake. It really does put people right in the center of the XC90. The XC90 changes the experience you have in a car, and we wanted to bring that to everyone. Welcome to Volvo Reality. So I know a bit more about this case. Uh, so this is a great story about how can you sell a product that hasn't been there yet. And I love that because, well, virtuality can do that. Uh, as you've seen, uh, they were uh, using this camera rig uh, and they actually really uh, filmed a lot of stretch, a lot of miles of road. Yeah, and uh, after that, they put the CG around what they uh, filmed and you really had the feeling that you're inside that car. Um, but they didn't just do the cardboard, because they, they were talking about cardboard, but they also uh, really used pop-up locations where they created these, uh, um, these, uh, these chairs where you could sit, get a, uh, actually the Oculus uh, on, a DK2 at that time, um, 
and uh, really have the feeling that you were sitting in, uh, you're stepping into a car. Also, the humidity of uh, the pop-up locations was the same as you would be in a car. So, um, what I liked about it was that Volvo really went all the way in this project, like not saying like, okay, we're doing something with VR virtuality, let's do a roller coaster, right, and then we say something about the car. No, uh, they actually really thought like, how can we really create an experience that you're in the car, and how can we really then invoke people to maybe buy that car? And this has been a very important part of that process of selling this car before it was there, and uh, this car has been a big success. So. I think this is a great story to uh, think about. And that's why, because of this story, I think you see a lot of other car companies really looking into virtual reality, uh, getting to this place where you can buy a car, like this car dealer, and you can kind of already uh, uh, see how your car is going to be by saying, like, I like brown leather or white leather. So that these kind of cases uh, are... Uh, uh, are, are enabling kind of, uh, or are like a positive, creative positive vibe for virtuality to far further roll out within, uh, within, uh, within the world. And, uh, and this is kind of, when I'm talking about business cases, this is what we need to show that virtuality has an added value. Uh, so uh, VR can also be used for, to create really a lot of empathy uh, and you can do that for certain charity purposes. Uh, because when you've got a glass on, you've really got the feeling that you're there. So uh, a lot of filmmakers nowadays are working on these videos, uh, showing here you see uh, the immigration uh, or the, the, the immigration crisis where refugees from Syria are all coming uh, to Europe. And, uh, and it really is far away that the, the, you've got the feeling like, okay, well, you know, we're in the Netherlands and I don't know where you're from, but it's a, it's a, it's a situation that's very far from our bed, far, far from your bed show, we call it in Dutch. Uh, but by, taking, uh, by putting on those glasses, you're really transported in the middle of this scene. And they're also really trying to uh, show these images on virtuality to, uh, to decision makers, who usually are like in these nice Geneva buildings to really get them to have a feeling about charity. But at the same time, uh, you can also uh, maybe use it to get more donations. So this is uh, what uh, charity can do with virtuality. So yeah, what are uh, benefits? I already was talking about them. So really creating empathy. You've got the immersion, but also total attention of somebody looking at it. And uh, it's really different than showing. You're really involving people. They're really experiencing it. and. Um, and that's really different from all the other mediums. It's, uh, if you haven't experienced virtual reality yet, uh, you cannot imagine what it is. You have to see it. Seeing is uh, believing, and you have, to be, you have to have it on to experience it. I'm saying seeing, but you should use the words experience it. So uh, I'm going to the training topic, but has anybody got a question so far on uh, VR for marketing uh, purposes, or maybe thoughts on what you would like to use it for? Or no, cool. Okay. So we'll uh, we'll go to the tra VR for training purposes. So I just have to introduce this because uh, so two years ago I started with VR Heroes, and uh, we've been really together with our clients looking into uh, what can we do with virtual reality. But at so some point in time, I really saw the benefit of using virtual reality for training purposes. So I'm working with a team that's a game designer, filmmaker, and we've got a project manager, and I'm the tech guy, uh, and we're working on this company called Warp, uh, and we're really focused on doing trainings. And um, so this is a new uh, company we started, uh, but what we really try to do is because there's such a strong emotional component in virtual reality, we try to use that to change behavior. And, uh, and maybe also the thinking. And uh, the cool thing is we're not just doing that uh, uh, from a high-level perspective, but we're really just already working on cases to uh, really try to, uh, to, to make sure that what we think is right um, is really right. So let me just uh, also uh, let somebody else talk about it. This is uh, Skip. I actually met him uh, last year at the Dutch uh, VR days. I think he is really doing amazing work uh, if it comes to using virtuality for serious usages. Uh, they are more into health, but let me just let him talk a little bit more about the emotional side of virtuality. 
VR is an evocative technology. It can bring out emotions that sometimes can't come out in other ways. And this is where VR shines. You can put people in simulations that bring up an emotion and then teach them ways to deal with that emotion in an appropriate fashion. We really look at how can we make a vision come alive? How can we satisfy certain requirements, but do it in such a way that we create an experience that's compelling for the end user? We use a lot of our own internal research capabilities, so generation of nonverbal behavior, procedural animations, natural language processing, etc. And then we add to that commercial capabilities speech recognition, text-to-speech, game engines, and we combine it into a platform that allows us to create these experiences more effectively. We also deliver cognitive or physical rehab after somebody with a stroke or traumatic brain injury. As well, we've done a lot of work with virtual humans that can serve various roles, like serving the role of a virtual patient to help a doctor, a novice clinician, practice their clinical skills in a safe environment. When you combine powerful capabilities on the technology side. You have a, a pleasing aesthetic that you bring on the art side. But on the design side, you make sure that we get a comprehensive and a powerful and immersive experience with all these three elements combined. Then you can get something that's really, really powerful. All of our work you know, has been in the scientific laboratory and in clinical trials, but now with low-cost systems, we can make the stuff that we do in the lab accessible to everybody. I think one of the advantages of working at ICT is the ability to work on something that really matters. Most of us really like games, we're big fans of it and big gamers, but the fact that we can work with these game technologies but are able to apply that to a field that really helps people is, is very rewarding. Okay, so this was uh, part on, uh, on what uh, these guys are doing. Uh, what I uh, really think is interesting, what Skip told, he, so they're also treating post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome, um, and uh, they can actually really use virtual reality to uh, get a soldier back to his worst memories and, and really uh, help him to cope with that and reduce the stress that he feels. Uh, and they uh, really, uh, they, they have proven that this really works. And what Skip is telling that they now have got the opportunity to do all this high-tech stuff, what they're doing, kind of going to push that throughout the world, uh, making sure that everybody can have the benefit of that is really an interesting time. I don't know, are there any game makers here or uh, people who work with Unity or, well, you are, I bet you work with Unity, yeah. So, so, but, uh, so if, if, you're into, if you're interested in this stuff, uh, you can do a lot with coding, which you already do, only then uh, uh, you can uh, do that for game engines like Unreal or uh, Unity. Like coding is a very important part of those game engines. Too. So if you're ever looking for a career switch, uh, that might be uh, interesting for you to look at. However, the stuff they're doing, they say it's becoming cheaper and cheaper, uh, but we really are focused on how can we make it kind of really accessible for everybody. You saw a lot of still, a lot of advanced uh, systems they had in the video, and that's why we are really enthusiastic about these two. Uh, and this is the Gear VR. So just, you know, you can just put it in your, in your backpack. It's uh, got a phone in it, but the experience in the Gear VR is really great. You've got a really immersive experience. And the Google Cardboard, which is, as I already told, just a couple of euros, and you can put any smartphone in it and already have a virtual reality experience. This stuff, you know, it's, I like this one the most, but this really enables people to have a very uh, low uh, entrance barrier to start using virtual reality and make them enthusiastic about it. And that's why we're enthusiastic about these two devices. So what we're working on is protocol, uh, escape, and uh, explore, and I would like to uh, go into these two, protocol and escape. So, um, if it comes to protocol, this was actually our first test case if it comes to VR training. Uh, we uh, hooked up with the AMC, which is a big uh, Dutch uh, um, a hospital uh, based in Amsterdam. Uh, it's actually called the Academisch Medisch Centrum, not Amsterdam Medisch Centrum, if you might think that. But um, um, at that uh, hospital, they need to train people on CPR every year. Everybody who's in the medical staff has, has to uh, for 100% successfully complete uh, a uh, CPR training. 
And uh, we really uh, want to investigate if we do this training in VR, is that more effective as you do it with e-learning? So uh, basically, to just give an idea what we have been doing, is uh, we created uh, this uh, video, uh, which puts you in different kind of scenes. And uh, what you're not now not seeing is, I can show it to you later on, uh, but uh, you would get these uh, arrows, which you can use to kind of decide that you want to go to uh, Sandra, who's here. And she then... That happens also not. And then she says, hey, you're okay, on time. We have only 10 minutes, but we can wel the And watch this guy. He's walking and... Uh, oh, wow! Oh. The man! Moeten we wat doen? So he falls down. So first question you will get here is like, what should you do? Uh, well, you should never first call 911. Uh, first, you know, go to uh, the patient, see what's happening. And actually, uh, you can make choices. Now people are just a little bit, you know, looking like, what, what should we do? But at some point, you actually in the protocol should decide that people should give you room. That's one of the parts in the protocol, because otherwise you cannot do your procedure. And at some point, if you really screw up, well, this guy, you know, says, I'm going to take it over. And uh, this is just the basic what we're doing. Um, uh, if you really want to show, see what we're doing, you have to see it in the, uh, in the glasses. Uh, because we are also using kind of CG elements also uh, in, uh, in Unity, we're actually using Unity. So we can really add uh, these uh, uh, interaction elements uh, with which you can uh, make choices. So uh, the results still need to be presented on uh, the, the difference between uh, e-learning and virtuality training. But we already got uh, one of the results is that it's, uh, people actually finish the course 30% quicker as a traditional e-learning group. Uh, and, uh, and we're really looking forward to all the results, but uh, as I heard from uh, the person who was researching this, that it was very, very interesting, very positive uh, for VR, so we liked it. And we also would have thought it was good if it wasn't positive for VR, because we're really exploring, like, will this work? Uh, and, uh, well, I guess if it's so positive, our follow-up will be to really distribute this app on cardboard and gear VR for the entire hospital. So to have also a place in the hospital where people on their own time uh, can use this, uh, this training uh, to train themselves on CPR. So uh, next case I want to show is uh, that's a follow-up on uh, what you've just seen, is the, what we did for the Royal Dutch Airlines, the KLM. Um, we uh, were asked by them, uh, actually also based on the stuff we've been doing for the AMC, uh, if we could help their maintenance crew to prepare on the case of, uh, in the event of a fire in the hangar. Um, this maintenance crew is working at these, like around these kerosene bombs, as I call them. I mean, these are these big jets uh, filled with kerosene. If something goes wrong, they really have to know at the spot, at the moment, they have to be ready, be prepared, what do you do? So that, that's why they need to train for these situations, because if something happens, you don't have to get confused about that. Uh, so together with KDM, we developed this uh, fire drill. And uh, just to give more an idea of, of how choices go, so if the fire alarm goes off, we'll ask, you know, what are you going to do? Um, and you actually also have arrows, uh, uh, like a street view kind of uh, way. Um, so you can move through the, situa through the uh, hangar. So here you start, you get some briefing about what you have to do for the day. And at some point, the alarm goes off. And, uh, but we actually have got two scenarios. One is that the alarm goes off. The other one is actually that you see something. You see smoke coming out of the, uh, out of the airplane. We actually also use some CG and Unity for that. Uh, and then you have to escape. So you go outside of the building, and uh, at some point, you know, you see the uh, you see a fire truck coming by, and you've got all these choices you can make. You can go through the whole building with this uh, training, and you can get in very nasty situations. I can tell you. So actually, here you see we still have to uh, edit this one away. You see, actually, see the camera still here. Uh, and at some point, you might take the lift. I hope you will never do that when there's a fire. <laughs> Well, 
know, you get the, you get the gist, <laughs> they're really scared. <laughs> At some point, actually, you don't see that here because we added that in Unity, we add smoke effects. So you see slowly smoke uh, coming out of the, the door and slowly you're getting filled and you see, you see nothing anymore. And that's how kind of this ends with, of course, one star, you know, uh, you're dead, right? <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, we've got a lot of these situations uh, in there. And you can also do, you can also get out of the building, but then you get three stars, which because you made some mistakes, so you get some hints, you know, how can you do it better, and then you do it again. So it's really gamifying the way people can do a fire drill. And the interesting part, just that's why I also want to show you the last part, is if you got that, uh, that, that uh, situation of these people getting scared around you in virtual reality, it really sparks a lot of emotion. It's really more interesting to see it as you see it now on a flat screen. So uh, the results, we still need to collect the, the, those, uh, but the uh, employee reaction is already very positive. We're really um, um, involving uh, some of the key employees to, uh, to try this out and test it, so we really get a lot of feedback on it. Uh, but yeah, uh, the real results, you know, uh, we're still waiting on that. So what are the benefits of these trainings? I really think uh, the emotional involvement of people. Again, like the marketing, the, you've got the total immersion and attention of somebody. If you've got a VR glass on, you cannot do anything else, so you can really make use of that. And, uh, and also, uh, one of the benefits fits is really you can train where and when you want. Of course, there's still a social thing, like do you dare to do it in the train, uh, uh, put a VR glass on? But uh, like with mobiles, people used to be a little bit ashamed having this mobile phone. Well, nowadays, maybe somebody wants to talk in the back. I, I wouldn't even care that much, actually. I mean, that's, uh, we're so used to phones, people are using it all the time. And uh, actually, one of the things I didn't mention, but uh, we're monitoring everything somebody do does, and, uh, and maybe even too much. So we're looking with the KLM, like, what do you really want to monitor? What are the key kind of things you want to know? Of course, you want to know, has somebody done the training? So you can really monitor ha how many percentage of the maintenance crew has done this training, that kind of stuff. But you can also monitor the choices they make and uh, reflect with them on the choices that they made and why they made those choices and maybe even learn out of that. But that's still kind of work in progress. So uh, yeah, I hope uh, I uh, sparked a little bit of uh, interest in also VR training uh, here. Uh, do you've got any questions about that? Uh, well, cool. So uh, yeah, if you're more interested in training, just look up uh, Warp Industries and uh, again, I hope you now already get a little bit of the gist, involve me, and then understand if you've got a VR glass on, you're really involved. And if, you, if you haven't tried the HTC Vive below, really do that, because it's, it's, as I say, you first have to experience VR before you can start thinking about what you can do with it. Okay, thank you very much for uh, attending this uh, presentation. Yeah. Oh. Virtual reality and gaming. The gaming part. Uh, I think it's also also there. Uh, a lot still needs to be explored. So if you let, look at virtual reality and gaming, um, the most popular games at the moment on the Oculus Store aren't the like the typical shooter games. It are the games you wouldn't expect. Uh, one of their most popular games was a game which is called I Expect You to Die, and you're in a car in an airplane, in a car, this, this cargo airplane, and you have to get out of the car, but you're just sitting on the chair and you have to look around you and start thinking about, it's like this escape room concept, but it's really great. I loved to play that game, but a lot of people love to play that game. And I think normally if you would have done it with a flat screen with your mouse, it would have been a, you know, a boring game, but here it was, it, it, it's, it's so much more interesting. And, and that's why I think, uh, you cannot just make a game, uh, like say we've got a game, it's 3D, now we put a VR kind of SDK on it and we've got a VR game. That will not work. So uh, companies for VR gaming still are really have to look into what is kind of what can you achieve with virtual reality and maybe a lot of different kind of games will be more interesting than they are now. Like uh, sort of maybe typical shooter won't be that interesting, but more of these adventure kind of games will become more interesting to play. But uh, I think for gaming, it's going to really, really be uh, awesome. 
Uh, and I hope uh, that the companies who make those games really think about, about VR. Uh, and also because if you don't think about VR, people get sick. So because there are a lot of things you can do so people don't get sick, but uh, you should really think about, uh, I therefore see virtuality as really as a totally new platform to create games for, yeah. Um, so yeah, we haven't really got really good augmented reality experiences, but uh, you would definitely uh, with, with augmented at the moment uh, because you, I, I did some uh, some kind of uh, test trials with my phones and uh, putting some uh, depth uh, sensors on my phone and then doing kind of also the HoloLens stuff and. Uh, um, it really depends on uh, how much of the kind of how much uh, of the screen is filled with stuff you're showing. But as long as you see the surrounding around you, uh, you don't really get that uh, sick. The problem with virtual reality is it, it can be very disorienting. And what you be, have to be very careful about is turning in virtual reality. So uh, you can also try that downstairs because um, uh, the guy downstairs has got like this uh, Xbox controller and try spinning it, uh, you know, try the, using the joystick and if you turn around you get totally dizzy and with augmented I, I bet that, will, that won't, uh, you, you, you have, you, with augmented you also already have to look around but I really suggest with virtual reality that you uh, force people to to turn around themselves instead of using joysticks for that. So the best VR experiences are you should at least either stand so you're free to look around or be on a turning chair. So Oculus recommends a chair, but uh, yeah, you should at least be able to do the full 360 and not do that with a joystick. Yeah. But that's, uh, yeah, that's just one of many tips to, get, to not get people sick. Uh, but if you do it right, people don't get sick. That's the cool thing. So, so uh, I always uh, think it's unfortunate if there are a lot of roller coasters at the conferences, because people just yeah get sick uh, doing a roller coaster. I mean, in real life, I would also get sick when I when I'm in a roller coaster. But the added kind of problem with virtuality and the roller coaster is if you have got a lot of motion. Um, um, and that's not really there, that motion, you get a disconnect with the real world. So you should really think about uh, if you speed somebody up too quick, you will feel, feel it in the stomach and virtuality. If you, but if you just do it slowly, it, it, it will be okay. So uh, that are things you have to think about. And that's why like a traditional racing game might not be suitable for virtuality but more these kind of uh, games where you have to fly this big jet where it's a little bit, you know, more relax these uh, motions, then it's okay to do virtuality. But uh, yeah, that, that's still a big yeah process. Everybody has to still learn how that uh, works. But there's more and more content on the internet also on people's learnings. Like a lot of people share, so that's great. So you can learn all from each other. And by the way, if you want to know more about VR, uh, I'm also organizing meetups uh, in Amsterdam and uh, Rotterdam. You can look it up on vr010.nl or vr020.nl. And I'm actually trying to get people together who are in virtuality to share their knowledge. And uh, I really believe that's really important to get VR kind of uh, to, to get it to a higher level. So, uh, so if you're ever interested in hearing more about this and a lot of uh, different uh, companies, programmers, developers, 3D designers come and talk there about what they're doing in VR. So uh, you're, yeah, you're invited. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it, it's um, uh, what we're now doing is uh, both question-based and, uh, and walk-based. So we're doing basically the Google Analytics where you can walk using uh, the arrows. You can look around and decide where you want to go. And at parts uh, where you are, you can use these uh, uh, different elements uh, to do things. Like uh, at some point you have to uh, press the fire alarm. So we made this kind of hotspot element. Uh, so you can press the fire alarm by looking at it. Uh, and we also got these questions that you get like, uh, you see this fire, what are you going to do? Because it's more kind of a protocol thing. Like, are you, do you know what you do? Like, should you call your boss? Uh, should you call 911? Should you leave immediately or should you uh, uh, press the alarm? And that kind of stuff, uh, so that's what makes it uh, interactive. And uh, what we're also trying to do is really, uh, uh, at the end, uh, create this hint system where people learn, like, what did I do wrong? And also have these hints, like, you will have this kind of uh, uh, 
um, below you, you've got this menu where you can actually see kind of the stuff you already did and learn from what you did before. And you get these hints like you did this before, uh, think about that. So that's kind of how we make it uh, more interactive. But at the same time, every project we're making more interactive. So, uh, so like uh, at the, uh, at the uh, first one, the CPR course, we didn't yet have this hint system. Now we've got the hint system. Uh, and uh, so we're slowly kind of evolving in that. Yeah, okay, cool.